All right, I'm going to talk a little food for thought on some potential futuristic scientific discoveries and some of the ramifications of such and some uh, gaps we have to fill in with our acceptance of some of these technologies, if you will. I'm still dying to see, well, literally dying because I actually tried it, to see a replacement for food one day. And I, I truly believe it's already feasible, but a lot of people don't want to think outside of the box. They think they're enjoying their food. The truth is that in a lot of ways they are not, right? A lot of people struggle with eating disorders. A lot of people could use the time they spend on food for other things, right? I recently just got into a little bit of a disagreement at work because here in Washington State they require a meal break and I'm fasting anyway. I'd rather get my work done as soon as possible. And uh, this is one of those cases where uh, a requirement kind of backfires because I don't even want it, right? And um, the truth is that food kind of, uh, I mean, if there were a food replacement, would I stop eating altogether? Probably not, but I would cut back a lot because even though I might still enjoy my food, not having to deal with it would liberate me to do other interesting things, right? I think our world would be a whole lot cleaner. You wouldn't have to eat on the go all the time. You know, uh, you could keep your mask on in an airplane without having to take it off to eat, right? A lot of things would just be easier. Earlier today, I went to uh, the shopping mall. We had a um, board game event. And I, as I walked through the food court, I saw somebody putting their finger onto a plate and then licking it. And it just reinforced the idea, oh my God, I hope one day this is over with, right? It really did. It was, it, it was just gross. I live in uh, Seattle where a lot of people are once again worried about COVID. I'm not necessarily worried so much about COVID. But at the tutoring center where I work, we have a couple high-risk individuals. And we've kind of all agreed to wear a mask. So it's kind of on my radar again to think about that. And I'm thinking to myself, oh my god, I, I don't. my coworker would definitely not want to see that. So it got me thinking about one day having a replacement for food. I think the biggest challenge is not going to be the scientific issue with it. It's going to be the politics of it. People are, they, they love their food. It's my right to eat whatever I want. You know... I never said I wanted people to stop eating altogether. I wanted it to be an option so that if you have to go without eating, what if you want to travel to Jupiter, right? Would you rather pack thousands and thousands of meals or a suitcase full of pills, right? That's the kind of situation, right? I would still enjoy food quite regularly if there were a replacement. It would just not be a burden, a liability anymore, right? Okay. Now, when Donald Trump introduced the idea of putting light in your body, I actually thought that wasn't so off. It's a little bit science fiction-y, but so let me give you an idea. Right now in my car, I have this hooked up to a place where I can plug in electricity. This is a UVB light bulb. That one's just full-spectrum lighting. And I'm thinking to myself... If you could have something that was non-toxic, some non-toxic battery, right? Maybe even containing lithium, so that, because lithium has some health benefits as well. I take lithium orotate. So a, a lithium battery that turns into lithium orotate once you swallow it. And you had some LED components that were non-toxic, right? Made with colloidal silver, maybe. Or at least silver that disintegrates into colloidal silver. It could be a UV light bulb and you can swallow it. You would digest it. You get some antidepressants out of it. You get some natural antibiotic silver out of it. And some, while it's at it, the UV light goes into your body. Gives you a nice tan inside of your body. What's not to love about that, right? It's science fiction-y right now, but I'm not going to completely write off the idea. Now, as I'm watching some YouTube videos on how-tos and all that, it always dawns on me that our language, our spoken language, whether it be English or Chinese, I speak English and Chinese, I'm learning a little bit of Spanish at the moment, but language is very tedious. Compared to machine language, at least, human language is very tedious, right? Machine language is very concise, right? C++, Java, there's not a whole lot of words that 
to just kind of circle the drain, right? It's very, it's very direct, right? In English, we have so many words that are just there to please people, that are just there to sound nice, but it's a waste of time, right? You watch a, let's say you're watching, let's go Brandon brag about what he's been doing for the last year. He's uh, campaigning. A lot of those words are a waste, right? All the ideas that he gives could be presented on much fewer bits of information, if you will, right? So it got me thinking we should have a language revamp of some sort, right? Where we completely rewrite the rules of language so that we can make things a lot more concise, right? And while we're at it, why not create one global language, right? We could um, uh, simplify a lot of things. The amount of knowledge transfer could be greatly enhanced if there weren't language barriers involved, right? I love to travel for the Computer Olympia. I always seem to have language problems when I travel. And it just got me thinking, after 5,000 years, can, can we have a, go a global agreement to, to, to kind of combine our languages in some way? And while we're at it, make it a whole lot more concise. I would imagine right now as I speak, at, at least 80% of my words could be eliminated without removing the, semant the, the meaning behind what I'm trying to say, right? Now... Right now, there's a lot of discussion about electric cars, right? Because gasoline prices are high, there's a lot of political pushback. The big problem is the range, right? And then I stopped to think about it. What are we using to power cars on other planets where we can't send gasoline? Well, we're using, on a lot of rovers, we're actually using radioactive uh, thermal generators. And it got me thinking, why can't we use that on Earth? So right now, as I speak, we have um, several rovers on Mars that are using plutonium-238, uh, plutonium which has a half-life of 87 years. We, we used that on Cassini, which was a huge waste, because Cassini was only up there 20 years. A lot of the plutonium was still good, right? Uh, but unfortunately, it was out of propellant to keep it in the right place, and... There's a danger that it could crash into one of the moons of Saturn. Uh, it got me thinking, 87 years is probably too long of a half-life for use on Earth because you would need, a, it, it would generate so little watts per kilogram. I'm thinking maybe polonium-210 because it has a half-life of 138 days and then it decays to lead. So you would need some way to recharge it back into polonium right, with neutron activation. And obviously, at the at today's cost, that would not be worthwhile. Right? That would be ha like having a space station in your car, right? Uh, the other problem is polonium-210 is incredibly toxic, right? It's used by uh, Russian spies to kill people, and so uh, you gotta be uh, gotta keep that in a, some kind of container that could survive accidents, right? So it doesn't spill out, right? Kind of like a black box uh a device right and then it's going to add a lot of weight to your car which is not not to mention polonium 210 and its dk product lead are both very heavy as well right but but i think it's possible actually the, the weight of the battery itself might not be too bad i mean we already have a lead battery in our car right um now i got i also thought about what happens i was watching the movie lightyear this past uh, month and it got me thinking what are the legal ramifications if you travel at a relativistic speed, right? Say I go somewhere a, a, a few tens of light years away and I come back, can I start collecting social security? Does my age like reflect my body's age or does it reflect, reflect the age of my ID, right? Got me thinking about that, right? What happens if, um, let's imagine that I, uh, I'm a little bit younger, and I, I travel to Proxima Centauri, and I come back. Can I legally drink at that point? Does um, Do you have problems with um, uh, uh, child molestation? If you molest somebody who is legally in their 20s or 30s, but physically they're still like 13 years old, would you have any problems if you had sex with somebody like that? It got me thinking about the legal ramifications, right? The first person who, who does relativistic travel is going to have a lot of a lot of legal questions to answer, that's for sure. Um, I wonder how that would um, be tested in our, in our society. Now, a lot of people are upset about how wealthy some of the uh, big players got during the 
pandemic, right? Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, right? Bill Gates. It got me thinking they're only wealthy to the extent that other people are going to trade with them, right? I mean, if you stop, if everybody stops accepting Elon Musk's assets, right, his his assets aren't going to be worth anything. Why, why can't we stop trading with him just like we stopped trading with Russia and render his wealth worthless, right? It got me thinking about that. And then I remembered we kind of did that with the GameStop issue, right? Anyway, some food for thought on our scientific knowledge, our politics, our sociology. Feel free to leave a comment if you have answers to any of these questions.